Hello, I'm Tom Manuel from Vanderbilt University. I'll be talking about small volume blood brain barrier opening in macaques. If you want to restrict BBBO to functional brain targets, we need to explore transducers with small foci. Images on the left show a macaque target, the frontal eye field. Contrast this with the image on the right, which is from a study which performs BBBO in macaques. The red ellipsoid in this figure corresponds to the focus size of the transducer. Notice the difference in size of the focus on the right and on the target on the left. We were curious how much we could shrink the focus, and still open the bleed BB through the macaque skull. So we designed a transducer optimized for this at cortical targets. Our transducer design was informed by transcranial simulations. We used a combination of K-Wave and 3D Slicer. The left shows how we placed transducers around skulls using 3D Slicer. The right shows a K-Wave simulation result overlaid on MRI. Skull size and thickness vary across subjects. So we ran all simulations in four uh, subjects to report average values across subjects. This visualization highlights both the average difference and the spatial difference in skull thicknesses shown for two of our monkeys. We noticed that for our target, inward steering improved the transcranial focal volume. This graphic illustrates what we mean by inward steering. Notice how the focus location stays the same, but the geometric focus is deeper for the one on the right. We electronically steer the beam inward. Pressure map shown here on the right you can appreciate that with the steering inward, we achieve a tighter focus than with the geometric focus simply placed at the target. So we use this in all uh, future simulations. We measured the, these results across four macaques and saw significant improvement in focal volume without affecting transmission. So we ran this in all future simulations. Uh, we also ran simulations with and without aberration correction to estimate the full potential of each design. So the aberration correction shown in the blue steering only is shown in the green, and then red is the geometric focus. We then look specifically at F number. These plots show transmission, focal volume, and axial spot size with F numbers between 0 0.6 and 1.2. Higher F numbers result in larger focal volumes and spot sizes, but have decreased transmission. We selected an F number of 0 0.9 uh, because below this, the axial spot size was largely unimproved. We also needed the transducer to be small for practical purposes. Frequency also has a trade-off, with higher frequencies resulting in lower transmission, but smaller spot sizes. We chose 1 megahertz, highlighted in the red arrows, because beyond this, uh, spot size does not improve without aberration correction. So here's our final design, 128 elements, 53 millimeter radius of curvature. It has an expected spot size of 3 by 11.6 millimeters. It was fabricated by Amazonic. This is what the array looks like with optical tracking gear and a water coupling case we built for it. Here's the case. Here's the coupling and here's the optical tracking gear. Uh, so we measured that the array performs as predicted by simulations. The top row shows steering results in water comparing measurements and simulation, simulations. Simulations in black, measurements in red. And this is lateral steering on the left and axial steering on the right. So we see we have good steering out beyond one millimeter with less than 50% pressure reduction. We can also appreciate at the plots on the bottom is that as we steer inward here, the focus tightens compared to our geometric focus, which is what we hope to see. So we tested this array for in vivo blood brain barrier opening. The left image shows an example percent change image uh, with the target indicated by the white crosshairs. We also measured for hemorrhage and edema with SWI and flare, respectively. And here are the parameters we use, specifically 2 hertz PRF, 2 minutes of sonication, and uh, pressures ranging from 0 0.4 to 1.4 megapascal. So here are results from our cavitation monitoring system tested in the water tank. What we can see in the top is a spectrogram showing frequency versus time. In the middle is a stable cavitation plot, an inertial cavitation plot extracted from the spectrogram. And at the very bottom is pressure versus time. So at our, as we slowly increase pressure, we can see stable cavitation increase. And this is indicated by the harmonic signals present in the spectrogram. And then as we go beyond this, there's inertial cavitation indicated by uh, broadband energy. It's also detected by our metrics. Um, these are plotted on the left as well, pressure versus time. Here's a, here's a photo of the setup. When we add the skull into the system, uh, the signals are largely attenuated. Our ability to detect inertial signals um, is diminished. 
we still detect some cavitation, some stable cavitation at higher pressures. And here's here's for comparison. If you notice on the y-axis, the uh, signal is largely decreased for stable cavitation, and then the inertial cavitation pretty much goes away. These observations largely account for what we've seen in our in vivo cavitation monitoring. Here are four cases with the two on the left showing safe low pressure therapies and the two on the right showing high pressure therapies with adverse effects measured. The takeaway is that at low pressure, uh, safe cases, our cavitation metrics do not track changes in pressure due to low SNR. There's not clear signal in the spectrograms. But at higher pressures, uh, we can see signals of inertial increase here, also shown here in the spectrograms and here as well. And these are correlated with adverse events. So we have signal at the unsafe pressures and we do not have signal at the safe pressures. We performed uh, our opening in 12 therapies at subcortical, cortical, and frontal eye field targets. This, this data shows three openings from each group where yellow indicates 50% increase in contrast. From these visualizations, you can appreciate a variance in opening volumes achieved. You can also notice that the shape of opening is often elliptical in nature as here and here, but also matches the contour of the underlying tissue structure following gray matter topography. Also note that the volume in these subcortical targets, the top is larger than at the cortical targets elsewhere. We sought to quantify this. We segmented each data set into CSF gray and white matter regions, which are shown here on the left, and with the percent change images on the right overlaid. We quantified opening volume for all targets, subcortical targets and cortical targets in gray and white matter. And these are shown here. For each group, opening volume is presented as a 10, 20%, and 30% enhancement threshold. 88% of opening volume was in gray matter using a 10% threshold. We also noticed that at the higher thresholds, the white matter opening largely is diminished. We compared this opening volume with mean pressure and max pressure. And both metrics are correlated loosely with the R squared value of 0 0.5. We also color code here instances of edema in yellow and instances of hemorrhage in red. And the edema is temporary. So we noticed that hemorrhage was detected at our highest pressure and edema was detected at some of the higher pressures. To go into more detail on these adverse events, here's a breakdown of the safety scans used and instances detected. So restating, we have T1 weighted for opening measurements. We have susceptibility weighted for hemorrhage checking and flare for edema. And in this case, we saw seven blood-brain barrier opening only cases, four with uh, blood-brain barrier opening and edema, and then one with all three. There are no cases of only hemorrhage. So the case of hemorrhage at their highest pressure tested, the safety scans are shown here on the right. And so at the bottom, you can see the flare with the hyperintensity at our target here. And then at the top, we can see the SWI with the hypointensity indicating hemorrhage at our target. So in conclusion, we designed a transducer optimized for small volume blood brain barrier opening using transcranial simulations. We used the transducer for 12 blood brain barrier opening procedures with cavitation feedback. SWI and flare were used to measure edema and hemorrhage. Opening volumes of 59 millimeters cubed and 184 millimeters cubed in cortical and subcortical targets were achieved. Cavitation monitoring provided useful information at unsafe pressure levels, but little information at safe pressure levels. In the future directions, we hope to deploy this for gene delivery for acoustically targeted chemogenetics. With that, I'd like to thank the members of the Caskey Lab shown here, and also the members of the Vanderbilt Imaging Institute as well as the NIH for funding. Thank you.